Welcome to uh, the first of several different uh, virtual gardening classes offered by Sun City. I really appreciate you uh, joining us for this class. It's going to be something new for all of us. <laughs> um, and I really appreciate Melissa and the rest of the staff at Sun City arranging to make this happen. Um, before we get too far in the presentation, I just wanted to say hello. Um, my name is Kathleen Carr. I own a company called The Growing Scene. We're a garden center and landscape company. Now, I started out actually as a horticulture teacher. Um, I enjoy teaching these classes because it really brings me back to the um, education portion of my life and realizing how valuable education is um, no matter what stage of life you're at. Speaking of stages of life, we're at a very difficult stage in uh, our country's history right now. Um, I just kind of want to just try to start out on a little bit of a lighter note by um, including this slide. Um, this time for many of us is incredibly difficult. Uh, I do hope that um, we're all able to lean on gardening just a little bit more as we go through, you know, the next several weeks and, you know, months and into the spring and through the summer. Um, it's, you know, there's not a lot of options of, of things for us to do kind of outside our homes. Um, and this time it, it may be even more valuable than ever to really focus on, um, on gardening and, and, you know, the endorphins that it all, you know, often, um, evokes, whether, you know, we're outside working in the yard or looking at flowers, there's all sorts of really good feelings, um, that are brought out um, by putting ourselves in nature. So I, I hope that, um, you know, I'm sure your yard will not make the trans <laughs> transformation that is shown on this slide, but I hope that you're able to, you know, to consider beautifying just, you know, one small area of your yard. Um, I just included this slide again, just to, you know, kind of continue the interaction. Um, this is myself. It shows a little bit of my yard um, with my husband, Chris, and then my children, Christopher and Sarah. Um, the four of us are really staying together um, during this time of quarantine. <laughs> um, we've, uh, we haven't, you know, put ourselves in public very much. Um, so it's really kind of just the four of us getting, <laughs> getting through the next um, several weeks to months, however long it lasts. Um, so to get on to the actual show, um, today we're going to talk about foolproof perennial flowers. Um, and I wanted to start with a simple definition um, to kind of set the barometer of what we would be discussing in the class. Um, foolproof uh, is defined as something that is done, made, or planned so well that absolutely nothing can go wrong. Well, we all know in gardening, things go wrong, and that's okay. Um, you know, none of us are perfect. Um, we, we do our best to ensure that our plants do well, but inevitably things go wrong. Um, I designed this class with a couple of key points in mind when choosing the perennial flowers. Um, I'm not going to read every single slide off of this presentation, but this particular one I really wanted to emphasize. Um, the plants that I've chosen are really plants that give you three different things. One, they're perennial flowers that will give you the most flowers possible. Two, with the least amount of care. And then three, with your greatest chance of success. So it's kind of like the perfect trifecta. <laughs> they're low maintenance. Um, they're usually, um, some people would use the term hardy. They're usually pretty hardy. They're going to be easy to grow and they'll give you a lot of color. So a lot of bang for your buck. Um, so it's, it's really, um, maybe not quite planted and forget it, <laughs> but planted and, you know, keep it well watered and these perennials should kind of serve you well. Um, so again, you know, thank you for joining us. I'm so sorry that we cannot have the uh, the interaction that we would normally have in a class. Um, but even though I can't hear <laughs> what your responses are, um, knowing what the class description was and kind of where I set the barometer, if you could just kind of, you know, take a few seconds and think, you know, hey, what do I hope that Kathy will um, talk about throughout this presentation? Um, it'll, you know, maybe kind of help you to focus um, what you were hoping to learn. Um, so some answers that I've ha um, heard in the past when I've asked this question is, um, you know, I have this area in the front of my home. I really want something that looks good as people walk up 
um, to my door to, you know, to ring the doorbell. Or um, I have this area back by the utility boxes that I'd really like to kind of cover or shield those utility boxes. Um, another, you know, common question or common um, statement during this slide might be, um, I um, would really like to attract pollinators into my yard. Um, so I've been doing this for about 25 years, probably for the first, I would say at least, you know, 18 years, maybe even 20 years. I consistently, pretty consistently heard, I don't want to attract bees into my yard. And basically that's what pollinators are. Um, now, um, kind of the, the, we're all realizing how valuable bees are and we want to um, provide the food source for them. So those are just, you know, there's really obviously no right or wrong answer what you're hoping to learn, but just, um, you know, think about what you want to learn. And then certainly if there's something that I don't cover that you had hoped that I would cover, um, feel free to email me or call me um, and I can try to, um, you know, try to give you a little bit more information. So part, I guess part of my nature is before, um, well, one, I don't like to go shopping. So maybe this is me just kind of, um, you know, putting it off a little bit. Um, but before I go shopping, um, I would typically, um, you know, kind of whatever I'm shopping for, whether it was, you know, you saw my son, Christopher, um, if he wanted a pair of jeans, um, I would first, uh, you know, make him go back into his closet and look to, you know, try on all of his jeans. I really wanted him to demonstrate to me that there was a need there. So I shop based on need rather than really want most times. Um, so before you go shopping for perennial flowers, I would just encourage you to um, really make it a point to ask yourself some questions to make sure that what you're, plan uh, what you're planting or what you're purchasing will go with where you want to plant it. So here's a whole series of questions to consider. The first one would be, where do I want to plant my perennial flowers? Uh, that would uh, really come into play that, um, you know, do you want to plant them um, so that I cited the example so that as people walk up to your front door, um, they would see them. So if you wanted to plant perennial flowers, say between a sidewalk and a garage, um, you know, that little, you know, that strip there, it's usually about 18 to 24 inches wide. Um, or do you want to plant the perennial flowers, um, maybe underneath a sunroom window? Um, number two, why do I want to plant the perennial flowers? Um, and there's the answer to that, you know, is, is you know, kind of, um, could be a whole variety of different answers. Um, an example might be, um, the, the one that I had, uh, used a slide ago or um, a slide or two ago, um, that you want to plant perennial flowers to attract pollinators. That might be a possible reason. Um, number three, where will these flowers be seen from? Um, if they're flowers that you're going to plant um, underneath your sunroom window, um, you would want to make sure that the flowers are tall enough to kind of eclipse the windows or to see, see them from inside. Um, or if they're flowers that you're going to put in the front of your house, but you always enter your house, like through the garage and the, you know, the garage door, um, you may want those flowers that, you know, that the passerbys will usually see maybe as they're driving by or walking, um, in front of your home, you may want them to be a little bit brighter or bolder since they're going to be viewed from say 20 feet to 30 feet away. Um, number four, what time of the year will I usually be viewing these flowers? Um, for some homeowners, um, they are not at their home um, for several months out of the year. And if that's, you know, if that's true in your case, then you may want to kind of skew the perennial flowers um, that you purchase to those that bloom during the time that you're there. Um, another example is many homeowners just aren't looking at the sides of their home in say March or even into April, um, in that case, um, you probably wouldn't want to choose, you may not want to choose flowers that bloom in March or April for the sides of your home because you won't be out to appreciate them. Um, number five, what type of, um, uh, what type and amount of light will these flowers receive? Typically, um, the north and the east sides of your home are a little bit more shadier than the west and the south sides of your home. 
Number six, are there any flowers from your childhood or for previous homes that you would like to have in your yard? Um, absolutely. I would really put a lot of emphasis on number six. Um, if there are certain uh, flowers that you're, you know, say your mother, your grandmother always planted, um, and, and you think of them, you know, when you see them, that I would encourage you to try to seek those out and plant them in your home. Um, the one flower that comes to mind for me is um, uh, Ozark sun drops. Um, that's one that my um, stepfather always planted um, kind of in a, a specific area. It was on the west side of our home and they always look so beautiful. And so whenever, whenever I see those Ozark sun drops, I think of him. Um, number seven, what flowers do I not like? Um, if there's something that you don't like, don't plant it. <laughs> Unless the person unless there's someone else that lives in your home that likes it, then there might be some compromise there. But if you don't like it, don't plant it. Um, and number eight, are there any plants that you see in your neighborhood that you really like? Um, I think the positive part of the quarantine is that we're walking around a little bit more than we ever did. Um, so there may be some plants that you see in a neighbor's yard that you admire. Um, and in that case, I would, you know, consider, you know, being socially distant, but perhaps asking that neighbor what they are. And, you know, if he or she doesn't mind planting some like that in your own yard. Um, number nine, um, what type of care will I be able to give these flowers? Um, this is, I think you have to be really honest with yourself. Um, there are some flowers that, um, you know, a little bit more forgiving than others. Um, and, you know, and if, you know, if your lives are typically pretty busy, um, then I would tend to plant the flowers that need a little bit less care. Um, number 10, what do I want to accomplish with these flowers? You know, attract butterflies, hummingbirds. Um, there are plants that definitely have a purpose. Um, they, you know, they come with those added benefits of being um, kind to the environment and to, you know, to insects and birds. Um, and you may want to, again, skew your purchasing a little bit that way. So to get out of the introduction <laughs> portion of the presentation and really start to talk about the fun part of it, um, I'm going to spotlight about 15 flowers or so that you may want to consider for your garden. Um, so the first one is called yarrow. Um, it's also known as Achillea red velvet. And as we go through the slides, you'll notice that on the top left of each slide, first I've included the botanical name and then the common name. Um, so if you were to go into a garden center and just ask for a yarrow, um, there's a whole slew of plants that they may guide you to. But if you're specifically looking for this Achillea red velvet, then you may want to just reference it by that name. Um, so yarrow is a fantastic um, perennial flower. It will get about 24 inches tall and, and 24 inches wide. So it does really tend to spread out over time. Um, if you're considering planting this, I would probably, you know, tend to plant one or three as opposed to, in, depending on the size of your garden, as opposed to say seven or nine, because you really do need to give it a little room to spread. Um, it, you can see by the side that it fl blooms kind of mid-summer. Um, it absolutely does great in full sun. Um, it will flower a second time if you would just kind of um, prune those or cut back the dead um, blooms after it's um, giving you that first flush of color in June. Um, it really is a low maintenance plant. Um, you can, when you're deadheading it or cutting off the spent blooms, you could also keep those blooms either for cut flowers or it also makes a really nice dried flower. So that is an option as well. Um, this is a ground cover. It's called the black scallop ajuga. It's also called the bugle weed. Um, it is it should be blooming pretty soon. I have not seen any yet, um, but it definitely um, blooms in May. Um, it is a um, phenomenal ground cover for shade. It's um, It does tend to spread out, I would say, somewhat slowly. It's not real aggressive, um, but it will tend to spread out. It also um, will take some light foot traffic. Um, it is a great... Um, choice for attracting those pollinators as we talked about during the introduction. And the next one that I've listed is Visions and White Astilbe. It is another great plant for shade. Um, and you can see it has a really nice um, bright white color that would add a lot of um, 
a lot of brightness to a really dark, you know, say of a dark shady corner of your home. Um, the one thing I would emphasize about this is, um, it does tend to dry out pretty quickly. Um, so if you were to plant a stilby, you're just going to have to watch the watering a little bit more closely than, you know, say that yarrow that we talked about a couple of slides ago. I've seen the edges of the leaves crisp up pretty fast. Um, a huge advantage or one advantage of this plant is that it is rabbit resistant. I know, unfortunately, in the community, rabbits can be a problem. Um, but a stilby is not that they won't eat a stilby, it's, but it's probably, you know, towards the bottom of what they will eat. Midnight Ruffles Helleborus, or also called Linton Rose, is blooming right now. Um, it is a really, really unique, I think almost a little bit tropical looking plant. Um, this one in particular, you can see that it has black flowers, <laughs> which in um, of itself is very, very unique. Um, and I actually like the foliage, I think almost as much as the flowers. The foliage is a really thick kind of leathery leaf foliage. Um, and it, I've seen hellebores that look great even in the winter, which obviously is really unusual for perennial flowers. Um, but it, it um, really stands up nicely, almost, I would say almost 12 months out of the year and blooms pretty early in the spring. Um, Coryopsis a grab. If somebody were to kind of really um, make me say, what is, you know, kind of pin me and make me say, what is your favorite perennial flower? I'd probably say Zagreb Coryopsis. Um, one, because of the bright, you can see in this slide, it, you know, lots and lots of bright yellow color it kind of just, you know, evokes a smile because it's so bright and yellowy. Um, it's also deer and rabbit resistant, which, you know, as we talked about, is pretty important when considering what perennial flowers to plant. It attracts butterflies. It's drought resistant. Um, it really just a, a great plant. And um, you do need to give it, though, as much sun as possible. It really likes that sun. Um, the next one that I've listed um, is turtle head. It's also called Colony glabra. Uh, as you can see, this particular one can get some height to it. It's, you know, I've seen it get all the way up to that three foot um, height that's listed. I like it also because it blooms pretty late in the year. Um, there's a, a, obviously a lot of perennial flowers that bloom in the spring and in the summer, but sometimes it's, it's hard to get that late um, summer into fall bloom out of a perennial flower. And this is one that does exactly that. Um, it will also take some, um, I wouldn't say standing water, but it'll definitely take some moisture. We had talked at, um, you know, as in one of the earlier slides about, you know, one area that you may want to plant is around the utility boxes. Um, sometimes that area can be pretty wet. Um, and then the utility boxes are generally, you know, kind of in that two and a half foot height, the range. So this is something that if you wanted to, um, you know, to look for some flowers to potentially cover that up just a little bit, um, this is one that you may want to consider. Um, so this is called Campanula Carpatica Blue Clips, or it's also called Carpathian Bellflower. Um, you can see really pretty blue cup-shaped flowers. Um, they, the flowers kind of float above a really nice compact mound shape, um, tight cluster of leaves. Um, I, because of the short stature of this plant, I love using it as a border plant or even adjacent to the sidewalk. Um, I had mentioned that most homes in Sun City have, um, you know, that a little bit awkward planting area between the front sidewalk and the garage. Bellflower, depending on the, um, the width of that area, if it's really narrow, bellflower may be a great choice for you just because um, it only gets, I would say, about 10 to 12 inches wide and certainly only about 8 inches high. Um, you can deadhead this in midsummer. You don't have to. Um, and just to expand it a, a little bit, what deadheading is, is it simply um, with Bellflower, you could probably just kind of pinch off the spent blooms, or you could take a scissors and cut them off. It's certainly not something that you have to do, but it's something that you can do. Um, the next perennial that I've included, it's called Sedum Ternatum, or it's also called Wild Stone Crop. 
Um, there are a lot of different sedums. Um, I like this one in particular, one because it flowers white. Um, a lot of the sedums either flower pink or yellow, so it's a little bit different. Um, this is also um, flexible because it can grow in containers as well as in the ground. So if you wanted to add like a, a succulent or a, you know a little bit of a different dimension to your containers this summer, I would con consider you to try sedum turnatum. Um, and then the added bonus would be towards the end of the summer uh, when you're maybe, you know, taking out the annual flowers out of your containers. You could take this out and actually plant it in the ground and it should come back um, the next year. Uh, most sedum are for full sun. This one in particular, though, can take a little bit. The Cheyenne Spirit Echinacea, or it's also called Coneflower. Um, on this particular plant, there's a whole kaleidoscope of colors. Um, literally, the Cheyenne Spirit includes white flowers, yellow flowers, purples, oranges, pinks, just a whole, um, you know, just a whole conglomeration of different colors on one particular plant, and then they tend to fill out over time. Um, this is one of the plants that um, will take some abuse. <laughs> um, it seems like it's pretty darn hard to kill a coneflower. Um, it can take a little bit of, um, you know, wind, a little bit of full sun, a little bit of drought. Um, it just kind of takes it and adapts and, you know, con continues to multiply and, and spread over time. It's not incredibly invasive, but it will definitely fill in over, you know, over a couple of years. Um, there is a note on here about dividing. Um, I'll just go on a little bit of a tangent for a moment. Um, so when you divide perennial flowers, what you're doing is you're taking a portion of one plant away from you know the other portion of the plant and planting some planting somewhere else. So in this particular example, it said you know it says generally about every two or three years you could divide the plant either in the spring or the fall. Um, we, to be honest with you, we don't divide coneflower a lot, but we, you know, you certainly can. Um, if you had say a coneflower that was about, uh, about 12 inches in diameter, really, I would just kind of chop that in half, take that, you know, kind of the six inch diameter portion and plant it somewhere else in your yard or give it to a friend or you know, give it to a relative. Um, and then I would probably, um, just keep that, you know, the original six inch plant part of the plant that you didn't divide just keep it where it's planted if it seems like it's a good location and then you know two or three years later you can divide it again <laughs> so this is called johnson's blue geranium um, it's a perennial geranium um, if you were to see this planted and you were only familiar with the annual versions of geraniums, you probably wouldn't recognize it as being in the same family, but it is in the same family. Um, there's lots of different perennial geraniums. Um, they come in white, uh, pink, um, blue, purple. Um, I like Johnson's Blue, again, because it's just kind of a tried and true variety of geraniums. Um, you can see it tends to spread out about 15 inches high, 15 inches wide, um, really blooms for a long portion of the summer and makes a great border plant. Um, I also like it because it's a perennial flower that can take some shade. In fact, in full sun, I found out it seems to me like it tends to dry out pretty quickly when it's first getting established, but put it in a part sun, part shade area, and it seems to do much, much better. Um, I also like perennial geraniums because they often have a great fall color. The leaves will turn to kind of a maroon uh, color, kind of a purplish maroon color in the fall, and they look great. Um, like the Halleborus or that Lenten rose that we talked about earlier in the presentation, perennial geranium often look great in the winter. Um, so if, you know, as you're kind of, you know, going through the fall and doing your fall cleanup, um, if you know, after say one or two hard frosts, your Johnson's blue geranium look great. I would not cut them back to the ground. I would just leave them alone. I mean, that would really be true for any perennial flowers. Uh, if, you know, say it's early to mid October, we've gotten some frosts and you're, you know, trying to figure out, okay, which perennial flowers do I cut back? Which, 
don't I cut back? I would really evaluate the foliage and let the plants tell you. <laughs> um, your hostas by that point are going to look, you know, pretty awful. Of course, those you cut back, the daylilies cut back, but things like the geranium and the hellebores you can probably just leave alone. So this is called Flames of Passion Avums, or it's also called Geum. Um, there's, I mean, there's not a tremendous amount of perennial flowers that have a really bright red fall color, kind of a, I'm sorry, bright red flower color. This really has a true red flower color, really brilliant. And it pops up pretty early in the year. I've seen these blooming um, anywhere from early to mid-April all the way through the end of May. Um, the flowers really just kind of the bell, like the bell flowers that we talked about, um, the, the flowers just kind of poke their heads up about eight inches above the rest of the, you know, the leaves of the plant. It almost look like they're floating in the air. They're absolutely beautiful. Um, it, they do, um, you know, they do best in kind of a little bit of a moist situation, um, but will certainly take anything from full sun to part shade. And they really bloom for a long period of time, which is fantastic. The added bonus is they attract butterflies. <laughs> so it's, it's just a great plant. If you have room for it, I would encourage you to try one of these. Another true red, <laughs> this is more of kind of a daisy type flower. It's not in the daisy family, um, but it's called Gallardia Arizona Red Shades or also called blanket flower. Um, it's a pretty compact version of a blanket flower getting only about two foot tall or so. Um, it there's a note in here that it uh, it thrives in poor soil. Unfortunately, many of um, the homes in Sun City, the soil is not the greatest. Um, certainly, soil can be amended or improved with time. Um, and I would encourage you, whether you're plant planting Gallardia or any of the other perennial flowers, to consider um, amending the soil with peat moss or mushroom compost. Um, but this is a Gallardia that will kind of take that rocky clay soil that is often um, found in new home subdivisions. Uh, this is a family of coral bells. It's called Heugera plum pudding. Um, the plum pudding coral bells um, is really noted for kind of the um, the gray overlay or gray modeling on the purple leaves. Um, the scalloped leaves are very, very distinctive. Um, from this slide, it looks the picture looks like we're, you know, looking at the coral bells kind of from above the plant. Uh, you can see the really tiny white flowers are there, but the main color, the main focus of the plant is those scalloped leaves, purple with kind of a grayish cast to them. Um, coral bells come. I guess I would equate coral bells a little bit to hosta in that. They're a plant that's primarily grown for the foliage, although coral balls, I think, are um, uh, a lot of people would say that they're much more attractive than hosta, but personally, I like I like hosta. I think they get a little bit of a bad rap, um, but coral balls um, really kind of bump it up a notch in that they typically have really um, either beautiful purple leaves, um, some are more of kind of a caramel leaf to them. Um, but just a great family of plant and plum pudding um, is really kind of at the, um, the epicenter of a, a wonderful array of plants. Um, coral bells, uh, in my experience, do better in part shade to part sun. Um, they can take the full sun, but they're like those astilbes we talked about. You really need to keep them pretty moist or they're going to crisp up pretty fast. Um, coral bells also look good almost probably not 12 months out of the year, but I would say a good eight months out of the year. Um, I remember a couple of years ago, I rang someone's doorbell. It was in early March. And then I was, while I was waiting for her to come to the door, I look around at the front of her uh, yard and she has a whole series of different coral bells planted and they look spectacular. <laughs> so even in March, this is a plant that really comes through for you. Uh, speaking of coral bells, <laughs> so this is another called Little Cutie. Um, or blondy coral bells. Um, you can see they're really big scalloped leaves. Um, the flower in this one is a little bit different. They're gen the flowers are generally not this showy. Um, uh, usually it's really just grown for the foliage, but I think the combination of the flowers and the foliage on Little Cutie looks beautiful. 
Um, really, really compact um, plant though. Um, it would be good for kind of a border as it's pictured here near a sidewalk. Um, just a really nice um, kind of accent plant. This is called Hosta Praying Hands. Uh, so I just mentioned that I do like Hosta. Um, I was walking around a home about a year and a half ago or so, and we came up upon this plant. And I honestly did not immediately recognize it as a Hosta. I would have leaned more towards um, kind of a tropical, maybe a canna. Um, and it wasn't until the homeowner said, this is praying hands hosta. Have you ever seen one of these? And I had to admit, I'd never seen it before. Um, the reason that it's so different, and hopefully the slide kind of depicts that, is um, the leaves are really, really folded tightly. And they have just kind of that um, that nice curvature to them. A really unique plant that most homeowners um, wouldn't recognize it as a hosta. It's kind of a, a little bit of a different take on it. Now, this is a blue mouse ears hosta, a little bit more of the, kind of the traditional hosta look, except it's really, really tiny. Um, it only gets about six to eight inches tall, only about eight to 10 inches wide. Um, and the leaves do look like just, you know, little kind of grayish blue um, ears set on a really nice um, kind of bunched area. Um, if you want to kind of, uh, you know, add some focus or filler plant to a shaded area, blue mouse ears will definitely give you that. Um, so this is a plant called banana cream Shasta daisy. Um, it is in the daisy family, uh, but it's uh, a daisy that has kind of a, a yellow overlay on the white flowers. Um, huge, huge flowers. Um, honestly, they can span about five inches in diameter. Um, lots of flowers. You can see even in this picture, um, not only do you see the flowers themselves, but there's lots of buds that are kind of tucked underneath those flowers. So when those are done blooming, you're going to have a whole new crop of flowers that, that kind of come up. Um, this does have, um, this particular lucanthemum does have disease resistant, um, which is a, um, a lot of the newer varieties um, can be disease and insect resistant, which is something that you might want to look for when you're shopping. Um, it also tends to spread out. I, again, not real aggressive, but it will tend to spread out. Um, this is called Pardon My Purple Bee Balm. <laughs> um, it has some of the same qualities as that banana cream daisy. Um, it's disease resistant, so um, oftentimes Monarda or Bee Balm are susceptible to mildew. This one is not. Um, Minarda also is known to be a little, actually, I would say known to be a, a plant that spreads a lot. This one does not. Um, so as um, hybridizers or, you know, plant growers develop new species, they're really trying to breed out those characteristics um, that are that we don't like and characteristics that we don't like are, you know, plants that get diseases or plants that get insects or plants that are really aggressive. Um, so the breeders of this particular, pardon my purple bee balm, um, have made it so that it's in disease resistant and also um, not as aggressive. Um, it also is attractive to hummingbirds and butterflies, um, which makes it a particularly attractive um, plant for your yard. Um, this is a garden phlox um, called Forever Pink. Um, it is also mildew resistant, um, and it has a really nice bloom time almost all summer long. I was talking about the hybridizers of plants. Um, there's just a note here about Dr. Alda, the Chicago Botanic Garden. Um, it, because we're located so close to the Botanic Garden, there's a lot of great plant introductions that come out of it, and this is one in particular that um, came out of it recently. Um, uh, daylilies like hostas, I think get a little bit of a bad rap, um, but we're talking about, you know, the class title is foolproof perennial flowers and daylilies absolutely fall into, you know, kind of smack dab into that category. Um, the reason I chose this particular series of daylilies is because they're repeat blooming daylily. And what that means is they're going to bloom not every single day, but they're going to continue to come back and bloom more and more and more throughout the season. Um, there's lots of, you know, there's several different, you know, everyday lily um, 
colors within this series and we'll kind of go on and take a look at that um so there's I really like the cerise that's um, printed on the or shown on the bottom right of your screen, um, but there's also several other ones to con, you know to consider. Um, I think pink wing is also pretty, and again, it's it's somewhat difficult to get that really bright, um, vibrant peach color in a flower. Um, that's why I, again think that um, if you don't absolutely hate daylilies and if you are open to planting one i'd consider doing one of these millennium allium is an ornamental onion um, you can see it has a really nice purple globe very distinctive look to a perennial flower um it again it's another rabbit resistant one um, it does make um, nice cut flowers or dried flowers although because it's in the onion family they have a little bit of an odor so just be aware of that um, and another plant that um, butterflies really love um, i just i don't ever remember having any problems with this plant it's just you know kind of you plant it keep it watered that first season or two and then after that you can just kind of forget it um, I have some planted in my own yard and um, you kind of honestly forget that they're there until you know you know July 15th they just kind of poke their heads up and shoot up into these really big nice kind of tennis ball size flowers um, and it's absolutely gorgeous to to remember that they're there um, after you know the the other times of the year they're you know kind of um, you wouldn't you wouldn't rec you wouldn't recognize them or think that they're anything special until they flower and then they look great um black-eyed susans uh, are really a tried and true um been around <laughs> been around probably for hundreds of years um this one in particular the goldstrom uh, there's a note that it was a former perennial plant of the year of 1999 way back when um Every year, the Perennial Plant Association gets together and they vote on one particular perennial plant that they're going to be promoting um, in that year. Um, there's been a lot of just great perennial plants that have come out of that program. My thought is that if perennial growers can you know, get together and agree on one particular plant, that I need to do my best <laughs> to promote what that plant was. And Goldstrom was the one that was nominated quite a few years ago but it's still one that's um planted widely in our industry and just a really nice addition to almost any garden this is called caradonna salvia um salvia is really distinctive kind of upright spikes of flowers um the one thing i would say about salvia is um if possible deadhead this perennial flower i know some of the other perennial flowers i've said you could you can if you want to you don't have to sell the if at all possible plan on deadheading this and it would just be you know once a year after it's done blooming for the first time you know, probably the end of june or so just kind of take a scissors out there cut off all the old flowers and then um, you should be rewarded with another crop of new flowers a couple of weeks after that um, with deadheading um Yes, ideally, there's a right way to do it. Uh, ideally, you would just kind of go down to the first set of leaves um, underneath that flower and cut the flower back. Um, I I'll, I guess I say I wouldn't get too hung up on how to do it. Just do your best. And um, as long as you're using clean scissors, you might want to, or pruners, ideally, dip them in bleach before you start. Dip them in bleach after you're done, just to make sure that um, you're, you're cleaning off any germs uh, and you're not like spreading a disease in between the flowers. Um, I think that you sh should be just fine. And again, just spending, you know, a few minutes dead hitting the salvia will uh, reward you with another crop of gorgeous purple flowers later in the year. This is called Water Peri Blue Veronica, or it's also called Speedwell. It's another ground cover. We had talked about Aduga a little bit earlier in this presentation. Um, this is uh, I would say similar to a juga in that it can take a little bit of shade, but it also does equally well in full sun. It does tend to spread out probably a little bit wider than a juga, um, but is a really fine texture to it. Um, gorgeous, gorgeous blue flowers, um, but it also has a really nice foliage, especially in the fall that turns a little bit of a kind of a burgundy or a maroon color. 
Um, so those are all this, the specific plants that I wanted to highlight, but I did want to get into just um, plant care a little bit. So after you've planted, um, really the, that first season, it's going to be wa keeping them watered all the way until the ground freezes in the fall. Um, also in the fall, I would consider putting a little bit of extra mulch around the base of the plants. So, you know, don't cover them up, just give them a little bit of insulation. Um, and then as I talked about, you may also want to cut down the foliage depending on what it looks like in the fall. Um, and then the next spring, after they've been planted for a, you know, a year or so or a season or so, you want to rake away any of that extra mulch that you put down the last year, the prior year. Um, cut back any foliage that you didn't cut back if it doesn't look good. If it still looks good, then just kind of leave it alone, like the coral bells, the Lenten rose, maybe even the geranium you might be able to just leave alone. Um, your flowers may have popped up just a little bit after uh, you know, from the freezing and thawing of the winter, just kind of gently reset those down with your hands. Um, continue perhaps that second year to water thoroughly until the roots are established. Um, continue deadheading um, as needed. Um, although a lot of the flowers that we talked about don't really need, don't necessarily need deadheading. Um, so as you've, um, you've kind of asked yourself the questions before you've gone shopping, um, you've gone out, you've and you've gone shopping, or I'm sorry, you are shopping. These are just a couple of questions to consider when you put yourself in the position of, okay, I want to buy some plants, but I feel like I need a little bit more information before I buy these plants. Um, one question you may want to ask yourself, where was this plant grown? Um, now there, you know, there's again, you know, may or may not be any right answer according to what you're looking for. But I would encourage you to try to buy plants that were grown in the Midwest. You know, you go to buy a Coriopsis a grub and it was grown in California. Not sure how good it's going to grow here. So just kind of look for things that are grown in the Midwest. Um, number two, what are the care requirements? Um, what are the water, sun, shade, soil preferences? Just try to get all that information. Honestly, a lot of it may be on a tag that's right on the perennial flower. So it's just a matter of kind of reading that tag. Um, number three, is the plant susceptible to diseases and insects? A good question to ask so that you can minimize the maintenance that you have to do over time. And number four, when does this flower? Um, that again, that information may be right on that tag. Um, if you're expecting, you know, to buy a perennia flower that flowers from April through September, um, you know, I think that's going to be a difficult expectation to meet. Um, so make sure to, to figure out, um, you know, what perennials you're looking at, figure out when they flower, and then maybe put together kind of a mix of flowers that will give you those flowers from April to September. Um, and then number five, what are the maintenance of recommendations for this flower? A couple of the flowers that we talked about, um, I referenced dividing. Um, if, you know, if, if you buy a cone flower or a hosta or daylily even, know that those flowers do better if you divide them. So just kind of know that up front and be prepared to do that. Um, so we had mentioned the perennial plant of the year um, in reference to the Goldstrom Black Eyed Susan, that was 1999. Uh, for 2020, the perennial plant of the year is Ariella Cordata Sun King. It's also called Golden Japanese Spike Nard. Um, it is a really brilliant, bright chartreuse leaf perennial flower um, that does just a fantastic job of kind of brightening up a shady corner, a shady area of the yard. Um, know that it can get pretty darn tall. It can get, you know, kind of three foot tall, three foot wide, um, but really, really pretty as long as you've got kind of the space to give it to grow. Um, just a, a great, um, great day. Um, a great plant does better in the shade, but try to, you know, try to put it in a place where it would get just a little bit of sun a day, but mainly a shade plant, shade perennial flower. Unfortunately, I cannot answer your questions, but if you do have any of my contact information is at the beginning of this video and you are welcome to email me or call me and I'll try to address the questions. I wish that I could answer them in person and look forward to, you know, when we can start doing in-person events again. Um, here's this uh, whole series of um, classes that I will be doing virtually. Please, if you have an opportunity, uh, join us for these classes. 
Um, I hope that things are going well with you and yours and that your quarantining um, is going well. Um, and again, look forward to the end of this. Um, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Um, I wish you the best um, and happy gardening.